are working our way through Matthew's gospel, and today we pick up in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. I'll actually read the whole passage that we'll walk through today. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it's written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you'll fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it's written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. And as we walk through this passage today, there will be two main themes that we'll talk about, and we'll kind of weave between these two themes, and, and both of them are really important as we look here. One is that Jesus is the victor over temptation, and then two is that Jesus is our example in temptation. And it's important that we see both of these things, who Jesus is and what he accomplished in history with this temptation here. And then also what we can learn about our temptation as we strive to follow him. Now, what we almost always do is we skip over what Jesus was actually doing and we go immediately to, okay, well, what am I supposed to do? What was Jesus's technique for enduring temptation? How do I copy that technique? And certainly Jesus, because he's our greatest example, is worth following. And so we, so we want to figure out what he used to resist temptation and use those same tools. But it's important first and foremost to look at Jesus and who he is and what he did. Because if we want to live lives of following Jesus, we need to start by having our hearts changed by looking at who Jesus is for us. So we need to look at the big picture here. Um, in the passages that we skipped, um, that we're going to go back to at Christmas time, Jesus' stepfather Joseph and his mother took him down to Egypt to hide him from the massacre that Herod ordered when he was a child. So Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, they were, were down in Egypt. And then when they got the all clear, they came back up out of Egypt. And then immediately the next story in Matthew's, in Matthew's account is Jesus going into the water for his baptism. And then today, immediately after the water of his baptism, he goes out into the wilderness for 40 days of temptation to be tested. And if you've read the Old Testament, you might recognize a familiar pattern here. The people of Israel had been enslaved in Egypt. They came up out of Egypt by passing through the water of the Red Sea. And then they spent 40 years being tempted in the wilderness. And now in Israel's story, they just keep failing the tests. They just keep grumbling against God. They keep sinning. They keep giving in to temptation. And they keep proving again and again that their allegiance to God wasn't full and wasn't genuine. So they just keep failing to be who they, they were, they're supposed to be. And now Jesus has followed in the path that Israel took, up from Egypt through the water. And now he's in the desert, not for 40 years, but for 40 days for his own temptation. And so Matthew 4 verse 1 says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So Jesus is going to be tested there, and this is the test. The question that, we, that they're going to try to answer about Jesus here is, is this the true Israelite? So this is round two of the testing in the wilderness. Round one happened back in the Old Testament. And round two now is Jesus the Israelite out in the wilderness going through his own temptation. And Jesus is really, really clearly communicating that that's what he thinks is going on here. Because all of the scripture that he quotes as he goes through this passage is scripture from Deuteronomy where the wilderness testing was first described in the Old Testament. So we'll see in a second that, that one of the techniques that Jesus used and that we should use to resist temptation is to know scripture and to quote scripture. But Jesus wasn't just looking for scriptures that kind of inspired him and gave him some strength for these particular temptations. He was pulling from one particular narrative in the Old Testament, the narrative around that wilderness testing. So Jesus knows that his testing in the wilderness is the chance for him to succeed where Israel failed. God had said he was going to get his glory through Israel. And Jesus is here as the true Israelite. 
to, to give another go at that testing in the wilderness. So, so that's kind of the big picture. That's what Jesus is doing here. He's coming to succeed where Israel failed. In fact, to succeed where everybody failed. Similarly, Adam failed in, in his temptation in the garden. And here Jesus goes to a worse environment out in the wilderness to see if now tempted by the same Satan, this Jesus will succeed where Adam failed. Now, one of the things that we might think when we, we recognize that Jesus was able to resist temptation is we could think, well, Jesus had a unique advantage because he's God. Like, of course, he was fine against temptation. He had all these God powers. And so we might think that because Jesus was God, he could uniquely stand up to temptation just by being God. And we might think that way about his whole life, that Jesus basically had his whole life in easy mode because the fullness of God dwelled in him. So he didn't have the normal human experience. But verse two actually corrects that wrong way of thinking for us. It says, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. It doesn't say he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, but it didn't affect him at all because he was God. It says he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and as a result, he was hungry. So he's not being described like a Greek God who is immune to human weaknesses and not feeling these things. He's being described like he's truly human. And it's important because if Jesus didn't get hungry because of his unique God powers, then we would also be able to say that he wasn't really tempted because of those same powers. We could then say that this temptation wasn't real. It's not as real as our temptation because Jesus could put his life on easy mode because he was true God as well. But because he got hungry, we know that Jesus didn't use his deity to cheat at being human. He was always true man and true God and his deity didn't make him less human and, and he never became less divine. But because he was truly human, he was truly hungry, just like we would be after not eating for 40 days, and he was truly tempted. So this means that Jesus knows what our temptation is like. He's experienced it. This is an important part of his mission. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So Jesus knows what we experience firsthand. And the author of Hebrews says that therefore, we can draw near to the throne of God with confidence. Because we're drawing near to a God when we pray, a God who knows, a God who understands, a God who's been there. And if Jesus ever used his deity to cheat at being human, then Christians throughout the ages could say, well, yeah, of course Jesus withstood temptation. He did that by using his God powers. That's not a luxury I have, and therefore it's kind of excused when I fall. They might be able to say he wasn't really tempted. He wasn't truly human, because when it got hard to be human, he just did some God magic and he got out of that situation. And if that were the case, we'd be able to say, well, he doesn't really understand but he never did that. So he was hungry and he was as weak as we would be after a 40 day fast. And the temptation that he endures is just as hard as our temptations. In fact, possibly even harder because we give in to our temptations at a certain threshold. You know, Satan escalates the temptation until we finally tap out and we lose. But Jesus never lost. And so that escalation just, just continued. He, he was tempted to the max. Something else that the fact that Jesus is tempted means is that trials and temptations do come to the righteous. I mean, sometimes we can feel like something is not going right in the Christian life when there's so much trouble and there's so much temptation and there's so much strife, and it seems like it never really ends. Like sometimes we think we're just going to get past this one next big mountain of temptation, this one next big problem. Once I get past that problem, I won't have problems anymore because that's the big thing. But it seems like we get up to the top of that mountain and then it's just more mountains, more problems. They just keep coming. And we can sometimes tell ourselves, man, if I had been faithful, it wouldn't have been this way. Life wouldn't be so hard. But Jesus didn't do anything wrong. And then the evil one came to test him. 
And this is always the way it is, that the kingdom of God marches forward in hearts and lives in the midst of temptation and in the midst of a ton of conflict always. I mean, you'll see it all throughout the life of Jesus, that there's, there's Jesus butting heads with all kinds of people, with all kinds of evil. There's conflict that never stops when the kingdom of God is moving forward. And then you fast forward a little bit to the early church in the New Testament. Listen to what Paul writes to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 2, 1. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. Like that's how it goes. The good news goes forth in the midst of conflict and pain. And this is actually all we can hope for until the return of Jesus. There's coming a day when he comes back as king and rules and reigns and all of his enemies have been put under his feet and there's no more conflict, no more pain, no more tears, but we don't expect that now. If Jesus, the only truly righteous one, had to live through temptation and chaos for his kingdom to advance, then certainly we will too. So it's going to be hard. Verse 3 says, The tempter came and said to him, If you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Now at first, this doesn't look like a huge sin that Jesus is being tempted with here because there's no commandment against turning stones into bread. And granted, the issue never came up before, but, but Jesus does on other occasions miraculously make bread for others. He, he made bread to feed 5,000 people. He will use his deity to bless others. He just doesn't use it to cheat at being human for himself. So there's no command in general against making miracle bread, lowercase m. And so, so he's, there's no rule that he's breaking. It doesn't seem like there's, being a, there's a, a sin at stake here. But there's a bigger print principle that if at this moment, Jesus decides to use his deity to cheat at facing temptation, he will fail in his mission to be the sympathetic high priest who, who knows what we're going through, who really lives like one of us. For Jesus to be proven to be legit, he had to be tempted just like we are with no out that we don't have. So he can't fail here. If he takes that, those stones and turns them into bread miraculously to give himself more strength for that temptation, then he's using an advantage we don't have. And then we could say he's not really tempted in the same way that we are. We could maybe even say that he, he didn't live like a true man. So that's what the test is. And then notice Satan's tactic here. He starts in verse three by saying, if you are the son of God, Remember last week's passage, what the father said at Jesus's baptism. He said, this is my beloved son. With him, I am well pleased. In the water, the father announced that Jesus is the son. And now in the wilderness, Satan is trying to shed some doubt on whether Jesus is the son. And so you can imagine the things that he's whispering in Jesus's ear. The father calls you his son, but now he has his spirit lead you out to the wilderness to starve you for 40 days. God calls you his son and then he abandons you in the desert with no food. That's your father? What kind of father doesn't give his son the things that he needs? And in fact, Jesus, I think you could care better for you than your father in heaven cares for you. And that's the temptation. And that can be our temptation too. We go through hard times and we start to doubt that God is or could be a good father to us because a good father wouldn't allow his children to experience this. We're tempted sometimes to think that it, if God really cared, he would give me that thing I'm praying for. And if he doesn't give me that thing I'm praying for, then I, I have to start to wonder if, his, if he's still good, if his way is still good, if he's still good to me. So if you pray for a spouse and one doesn't come, you can start to wonder, is God good? Will God still be good to me if I never get that relationship? And if not, if, if he's not going to be good to me, why not cut corners? Why not just marry someone outside the faith? Why not just go for anybody here? Because obviously God doesn't care that much. He's not a good enough father to provide for me, so I got to do it myself. Or will God still be good to you if you never have 
the career that you pray for? Will God still be good if you never have the success you're after? Is God still good in his commands, even when following his commands doesn't seem to be working out for you? And if he doesn't seem to be good, maybe he's not my father. Maybe he doesn't love me. Those are some of the doubts that, that come up when we're tempted. And now remember how Israel failed here. Way back in Exodus 16, God had rescued them out of Egypt. He had actually called them his son. They were being treated like the unique son of God, but now they're out in the wilderness of Zin. They're hungry and they start to grumble. And they even start to say things like, I wish we had stayed in Egypt. At least there was food there before God came and rescued us. Maybe this rescue wasn't good. Maybe God's plan is not good. God had treated them like sons and singling them out for a rescue, but now their faith was tested because they didn't have any food out in the wilderness and they start to grumble and fail the test. They grumble against God, so God is not honored through them as intended. And here, Satan is whispering in Jesus' ear trying to get him to fail in the same way. This is how God treats his son? Maybe you're not really his son. And so now Jesus has two competing voices in his head. He has the father's voice from the, from the water where the father said, this is my son. And then he has Satan's voice that's saying, if you are the son, which kind of seems unlikely given these circumstances. And these two voices are in his head while he's worn down from fasting. He's hungry. He's worn out. He's in the hot desert sun. And he's really tempted and he has to figure out, is he going to listen? Which voice is he going to listen to? Which voice is the voice of truth? Which one do you believe? Verse four, but he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus triumphs in this first temptation because he believes that the voice of the Bible is the voice of God. He believes the voice that lines up with, with the Bible. What doesn't agree with the Bible doesn't come from God. And on leaning on God's voice in the scripture, Jesus overcomes temptation. He triumphs by perfectly relying on God and he perfectly relies on God by perfectly relying on the scriptures. And this is important for us to follow because we live in a world with so many subtle lies. I mean, our appetites and desires lie to us all the time. Our guides and leaders will lie to us. Our culture embodies lies about what's good and what's evil. We're lied to about what reality is, about right and wrong, what's good and bad. We're lied to about what God does and doesn't say. There are all these competing voices about what we should do and shouldn't do, who we are and who we're not, how we should feel and how we shouldn't feel. And all of the voices at times can sound good. They can seem right, they can feel right, there are all these different competing voices and the question keeps coming up, which one do we believe? Will the scriptures speak to us the very words of God? That's where we hear the voice of the Father. When you're tempted, you can know that the words of the scripture are the words of God and how we respond to the scripture is how we respond to God. So Jesus quotes the scripture that says, man shall not live by bread alone. And again, all these scriptures that he quotes are from Deuteronomy chapter six through eight, where Moses is talking to Israel right before they go into the promised land. And he's reminding them of all that God had done for them when they wandered in the wilderness. That was the place where God educated them. He put them through a number of hardships so they could learn what it means to live by faith, to, so they could learn what it means to live a life of trusting God. And while they were there, he allowed them to be hungry for a time. And then he fed them with manna. And that hunger was to show them that their life didn't come first and foremost from bread. Our life is sustained by more than just the physical things that we need. Our life comes from the word of the Lord. As people, we are not animals. We don't live by physical appetites and physical needs alone, but we are dependent on the words of God. So Jesus is tempted, which voice will he listen to? And he listens to the voice of God in scripture. God had said that he was his son and that hunger didn't prove otherwise because in the Bible, God allowed his son Israel to hunger for a time. 
And so Jesus will trust God rather than undermine his true humanity and his true mission just to get some food. So he passes the first test. It's point Jesus. And then Matthew 4, verse 5, the, the next test comes up. It says, The devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it's written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. So Satan here tries a new tactic. It's like he went in at halftime and said, all right, I got to adapt to this guy. Um, this guy seems like he's really influenced by scripture. So maybe if I could go out there and I could quote some scripture, that'll create some confusion. That'll maybe give the, the Bible verses that I quote, maybe will give some of my, my words a, a false weight and authority. And so he comes out and starts quoting scripture to Jesus. And this is a warning to us that a tactic of the enemy is to make the scriptures seem to say what they don't say. Scripture says that the, the devil masquerades as an angel of light. He would love to make you believe false things by taking the scripture out of context. One of his tactics is he does evil things with good things. He lies with the truth. And he knows and quotes the Bible, which means that it's necessary for us to know not just a lot of out-of-context phrases and sayings from the Bible, but to know the story, to know how it all fits together, to know theology, to know Bible doctrine, to know what verses mean and they don't mean. So we're all called by this to be students of the Bible. And I'd encourage you to, to take advantage of some of the institute classes we offer, to read your Bible, to know theology, to know the right uses of scripture, because many lies come our way through misuses of the Bible. So Satan sets up this test. He brings Jesus up to the pinnacle of the temple. Um, this is probably the royal porch on the southeast corner of the temple, which was a porch over a cliff. And so it created a 450 foot drop. Uh, historically, this is the place where, according to a few accounts, James, the brother of Jesus, or James the Just, was thrown down and then beaten to death as, as a martyr at the bottom. And so the test from Satan here is throw yourself down. If you're God's son, surely he will keep you safe. But if Jesus does this, this will be a pointless miracle. It'll actually be not an act of faith, but it'll be unbelief masquerading as faith because all it would be doing is putting God to the test. It's not going to God for help and asking for real help, but it's saying, oh yeah, God, you say you're God, then prove it to me. It's testing him and, and Jesus knows that's not how we're supposed to use the scriptures or the promises of God. We don't use them as tests. So again, Jesus rightly quotes scripture, verse seven, it says, Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And God does miraculous things. God does take care of his children. But miracles aren't meant to be used to test God. That's actually a satanic use of miracles to say, if you're really my father, then I demand that you do this trick. We don't manipulate God by demanding miracles. God's not our, our pet who does tricks for us on demand to show his greatness. And so Jesus quotes scripture. This time he quotes Deuteronomy 6.16, where it says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. And back in that story, Massa was the place where the people started asking, is the Lord among us or not? At a time when they had no water. And so the test here is, will God really protect you? Is God really with you? Prove it by doing a pointless miracle. And Jesus doesn't put God to the test like Israel did. He, he, he passed. So chapter four, verse eight, it says again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give to you if you'll fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it's written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. So the devil takes him up to a place that Matthew calls a very high mountain. But there's not a mountain peak anywhere where you can see all the kingdoms of the world. So there must be some kind of like vision that's going on where, where Jesus is able to see all of the glory of all the kingdoms of the world. And the test here is that Jesus has made an offer. It, Jesus, if you'll just bow down and worship Satan, then you can rule over all those kingdoms. Which is an exaggerated offer. 
And this is another one of Satan's tactics. Satan does have real power and real authority that he has seized, that he's stolen. He has huge influence because he, he holds the hearts of, of men and women all around the world. But ultimately, he doesn't have the, the kind of absolute authority that he's offering here. I mean, throughout the ministry of Jesus, you see Jesus encountering demons and the demons get cast out. You see Satan sent away by Jesus. Jesus always has more authority than Satan. But ultimately what he's offering here to, to Jesus, what Satan's offering to Jesus is something that isn't fully his. And this is big because when we're tempted so often, our temptation over promises, but then under delivers. There, there's always something to lure us in. There's always a bait. But then once we take that temptation, it never goes well for us. And so the affair promises a thrill, but it delivers only a momentary thrill followed by what could be a lifetime of sorrow. Telling that lie promises to get you out of a situation, but it also delivers a sense that, that now I have to look out for me by my own means. I got to care for myself so I can't count on God to look out for me. And now you need, have a need for five more lies to, to cover up from the first one and they all cascade. It offered you an easy out, but the out wasn't so easy. Or sometimes you could look at your calendar and the busyness of it and you could think, you know, if I just isolated myself and gave up on all this trying to experience real Christian relationships, my calendar would be so much more free. My life would have so much more peace. I would have so much less drama in my life if I just didn't do those things. And so we distance ourselves from Christian community because we feel like we just need a break from the drama but then we find loneliness, we find disconnectedness, and, and yeah, we have a freer schedule. Calendars get more free without Christian community, but life doesn't really get happier like we thought it would. Temptations always exaggerate what they have to offer to us. But that being said, Jesus really was tempted here. So how is this a temptation? How is it a temptation for Jesus to worship the devil? seems like that's an easy one to not fall to. Like, what, what's the real temptation underneath this? Well, think of all the good that Jesus could do for the world if he started to rule. I mean, there were wicked kings all over the world oppressing people. And imagine if Jesus could go and take their place and, and free all of those innocent victims. Imagine if there was justice with Jesus ruling and reigning, all of the corrupt judges all get thrown out and now justice rules. Think of all the ways that the world would change. You look around the world and you see all the ways that the wicked win and the righteous lose. If Jesus sat on the throne, he could fix all that and think of all the goodness that he could usher in if he just took Satan up on his offer and took that throne. He could rule well and, and ruling isn't wrong. And Jesus has rightful rule and reign over everything. He wouldn't be receiving from Satan anything that wasn't rightfully his. Any rule and reign that Satan had over the world was something that he stole from Jesus anyway. So if he gives it back, it really wouldn't be wrong for Jesus to use it. I mean, if, if you steal my car and then you bring it back to me, I'm not going to feel guilty for using that car now because it, it wasn't yours to begin with. And the plan all along has been that Jesus will receive power and will rule over the world. The angels announced that that was the case when Jesus was born. So what's the temptation here? Well, this is a test of what kind of savior Jesus would be. Would Jesus be the kind who is faithful to his father, who goes to the cross, who triumphs over death and ends up receiving power from his father in the end? Or would he short circuit that whole plan and just seize some power now? I mean, think what this would mean if Jesus takes the bait here. He gets the throne and let's say that Satan could deliver and Jesus rules over all the kingdoms of the world, but he now has gotten that throne without going to the cross, which might be good for him and his own comforts, but it's terrible for everybody he would rule over because while one of our major problems is corrupt leadership in the world, that's nowhere near our biggest problem. Our biggest problem isn't bad politics. That's not the root problem in the world. It's important to remember now, I know November 2024 is coming and we are already starting to hear the drumbeat as it approaches, 
in, in every election cycle, that same song is sung every time, that the biggest problem we have is our leaders in Washington. We need to be saved from bad leadership by these good leaders that you should vote for. They have come to our rescue. You need to be afraid of what will happen if these bad guys keep ruling. Um, we need a good Congress and we need a good president to come save us. But if we got a great leader in the White House and we got a great Congress, that would certainly be an upgrade. <laughs> like that would certainly be better than bad ones but they still would be leading a nation with wicked hearts. It's not like crime would go away. It's not like sin would cease. It's not like strife would end. In fact, some of it might even get more heated because wicked people aren't really fond of having righteous values shoved down their throat, so new tensions could emerge. So even if Jesus, the perfect one, were to seize that throne and rule and reign uh, from that throne on earth, he's still ruling over people with wicked hearts that can't respond to righteousness. But Jesus came to get sin out by the roots. And the root of our sin is not our bad politics. That's just one fruit of our sin. And to really remedy our deepest problem, he had to go to the cross. That was the only solution. And if Jesus seizes the throne now, he'll rule from a throne over subjects who had no way to have hearts that were actually conformed to him in his ways. And he'd be ruling over subjects who would die and perish in hell because God is just. And sure, he'd have some comfort, he'd have power, he'd have a much easier road if he just went to a throne instead of the cross. But he wouldn't accomplish redemption. God's plan was never for Jesus to have the crown without a cross. His plan was never for Jesus to seize power, but to receive power. Jesus was tempted here with this easy way to the top. And for us, this is a real temptation too. There's always a temptation toward the wrong kind of power and leadership. And I say that believing that power and leadership and hierarchy are all good things. Those are not innately evil things. I mean, if you devote your life to working in a field, it makes sense that as you increase in your knowledge and your skill and your influence and you're known for your dependability, that you would move up and you'd have more people under your leadership. You'd have more money at your disposal. You'd have bigger decisions on your desk. That, that's a good system. And people like that can be a good thing and, and that can be wielded for the good of a lot of people. And then when power comes to us because of service, that can be used well and can cause many people to rejoice according to the book of Proverbs. So that means we don't have to be suspicious of all powerful people, of all rich people. But there's a temptation to seize power for our own sake. To say, I want that for me just so I can be in charge. Just so I can be in control. So I can tell people what to do so I can be in the know, so I can be the master of my own destiny. And that's a very different approach than serving faithfully and being entrusted with more and more to serve faithfully with. Christians who follow in the footsteps of Jesus don't try to be powerful for power's sake. They try to be helpful and good. And when they lead, they try to lead for the good of others. When leadership roles come their way, if they decide to take them, they use them to serve others, never to domineer, never to treat people harshly. And Christians don't aim to be rich, they aim to be productive. And then when money comes their way, they use it wisely and for good. Christians don't try to be famous and they don't try to be seen and known. They just try to be good and to do good. And then if that somehow results in fame or some kind of platform, then they hold to that really loosely and they use even that for good. And pretty often we'll talk to people who come in and say, you know, I really want to be a teacher. I really want a platform here, but they don't really know what they want to teach. They know they want to see themselves on a platform, but they don't yet know what they want to say. And they're not necessarily living those things. In their mind, the goal is the stage. The goal is the lights. They, they seek the platform first and then helpfulness to other people second. And we start to believe the lies of the influencer culture around us that says that being famous is its own good. But as Christians who are following Jesus, we want to seek to, to be good and seek to serve and seek to love. 
And if someday, somehow, that does result in some kind of power or position or money or platform, you can receive those things with caution and with thanksgiving. You can hold to those things loosely, use them only for good, but you don't take shortcuts to get there. And Jesus isn't going to take a shortcut to power. His mission has been determined ahead of time. He is going to be faithful to the point of death, even the death on the cross. He's going to conquer the grave and rise, and only then does he sit on a throne. Only then does he receive power, and that'll be power received and earned and deserved, not power seized with shortcuts and false worship. So he passes the test, and this is as far as Satan goes. That was all that he could do to tempt Christ, and so he went away defeated. Jesus has won. Satan couldn't make Jesus do things. And also, he can't make us do things either. Augustine said that that Satan can do no more than suggest. It's really only the tempted Christian who could do, do wrong. He can't make us do the wrong. And though we often do wrong when we are tempted, Jesus came and triumphed over Satan in our place. And this is the big message of this passage, that we're supposed to see a fundamental victory where everybody else had failed. That this one was different. Jesus really is the victor. It's like he fixes all of the Old Testament stories that went bad. Way back in the garden, the tempter came up to Adam and tempted him to believe a lie and sin. And Adam believed that lie and he sinned and he brought the fall upon humanity. But here goes Jesus, not into a perfect garden, but to a terrible wilderness. And there Jesus passes the test that Adam failed. Back in the wilderness, Israel doubted and they grumbled and they sinned and they failed their tests. But here Jesus goes back out to the wilderness And there he doesn't grumble, he doesn't fail, he doesn't sin. You and I, we believe the lies. We live for self. We come up with systems that are better than the system of Scripture. We come up with a better way to approach our our issues than the Scripture gives us. We sin, we fail the test. But here's Jesus, our champion, who comes to that place where everybody else has failed, who accepts on himself all of our non-sinful human limitations, who becomes weak through 40 days and 40 nights of fasting, who faces temptation that's as real as ours and maybe more severe than ours. And in that wilderness, he endured temptation, he passed the test, and he was confirmed as the true Israelite, the true son of God. Jesus is who his father said he was at his baptism. And then just a few years later, he's going to go to the cross. And there he'll be tempted, I'm sure, to take the easy way out. To just seize a throne, to just send 10,000 angels to destroy all these crazy people and not have to do this hard thing. I mean, how, how tempted would he have been from the cross to not love his enemies when it was that hard, when they were that evil, when they were that bad to him? They were nailing him to a cross and still he prayed, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. There would have been massive temptation to walk away from all that and not be faithful to his father. But still he was faithful and he gave his life for us. And then having been faithful to the end, he rose from the grave and he's still reigning today, seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And he's currently ruling and reigning for our good, putting all of his enemies under his feet. He's changing the hearts of all those who would turn to him. He's forgiving everyone who would trust in his cross and what he accomplished for them and who would turn from their sin and their unbelief. And then one day he'll return and make all things new and put to death every last enemy that he has. The last enemy to be defeated is death. Jesus is our champion. Jesus is our victor. He is the one who reigns in our place. And so if you're here today and you think, okay, I've heard about Christianity and I kind of thought Christianity was just this religion where we try to fight temptation. Here are certain things we're not supposed to do, so I'm going to try real hard not to do those. And I can look at Jesus and see the example of how to try real hard not to do those. And that's part of what Christianity says. But the other thing it says is that we all fail when we try really hard not to do those. There's actually much better news for you than that. And the better news is, is that Jesus succeeded in every way that you failed. 
Jesus didn't stumble. He passed every test that you couldn't pass. Even though you've given in in sin when you're tempted, Jesus never gave in in sin when, when he was tempted. He's the only one who had the perfect resume all the way through his life. There was never a moment of sin. There was never a stain. There was never a blot. There was never anything unrighteous or unjust in Jesus. But then he went to the cross and took the punishment that was reserved for unjust, wicked people. And the reason he did that was to take your punishment for you. Even though he didn't deserve that punishment, he took the punishment that you deserve. And then if you'll turn and believe in him, if you'll trust in him, if you'll turn from what was driving you before, if you'll turn from whatever was ultimate to you before and make Jesus ultimate and trust in his death, burial, and resurrection on your behalf, he'll forgive you of your sins and he'll take his perfect record of righteousness and withstanding te temptation and he'll give that to you. That becomes yours. So now you can approach your father now and through all eternity. Not because you earned it, not because you passed the test, but because Jesus passed the test for you. And when you believe in him by faith, not through the works you do, but just trusting in him and what he did for you, that all gets credited to your account. And you can spend all eternity praising your father for his goodness, for his provision, for his love. You can praise the son for his faithfulness and the way that he endured temptation and made it all the way to the end for you. And you can praise the spirit for giving you that gift of faith so that you would believe in that and then be connected to that forgiveness by his grace. Mm -hmm.